<coughs> okay, let's start that off with a cough. Um, this is part two of the z-scores and, and normal distribution lectures. So let's talk more about z-scores. We learned how to calculate them sort of seat of our pants last time, which is sometimes all you need. Z-score is not a complicated thing. It's just the, n well, as long as you understand what a standard deviation is <laughs> and a mean are, and a mean is, those, then it's not complicated. Then a z-score is just the number of standard deviations away from the mean. So a z-score lets you navigate inside any distribution. It lets you find, if somebody gives you a score, you can say, this score is such and such distance from the mean, taking into account the variability. So you can locate scores in a standardized way. So if you just knew that a score was such and such number of points from the mean, so, oh, I got, I study three more hours than my friend, or I study three more hours than average, you don't know what that means. Maybe a lot of people study three more hours than average, or maybe three more hours than average, like nobody studies that much. You don't really know unless you have variability included. So instead, we count in standard deviations. And then if you say, I study three more hours than average, which is a z-score of plus 0 0.5, or it's one half a standard deviation above the mean of all people's studying, then a person should not be very impressed. But if you say that's a four point, of a four z, a z score of positive four, and it's um, four standard deviations above the mean, you should be extremely impressed, because that's a big difference. So you need two pieces of information to locate any x, in other words, a raw score, any specific value from a specific observation inside a distribution. You need the distance from the mean and you need the direction. Now the distance needs to be measured in z-scores for this kind of location that we're talking about here. Or sorry, in z-scores in standard deviation units, same thing. And the direction is just plus or minus. So if you want a formula, this will do everything that we did last time. It'll just do it in a slightly more structured way. The z-score of a particular score is the observation's value itself. So the z-score of the observation is the value of the observation minus the mean. We do it this direction, not mean minus x, but x minus mean, so that if you have a raw score that is bigger than the mean, then the result of this will be positive. And if you have a raw score that is smaller than the mean, then the result of this will be negative. So it's just a deviation, which you already know how to do from doing standard deviations. It's the deviation from the mean divided by the standard deviation. In other words, it's the deviation from the mean turned into standard deviation units. So it's saying, how many standard deviations is this raw deviation, this raw distance? So easy little formula. Um, we're going to do a lot of problems, which will prepare you for the really uh, funky and interesting work later in the semester a lot of problems now that are like this. Someone will give you a raw score, someone meeting, meeting your instructor or the textbook. They'll give you a raw score, some kind of a value that's some observation value that comes from some distribution. And to be clear, z-scores work with any distribution, whether it's skewed or normal or crazy shaped or, what, or whatever. However, when we use them with a normal distribution or a distribution that is sort of normal, that's mostly normal, we say it's approximately normal, then we can use the normal approximation. So we, can, so we can use the areas and proportions that we know exist with the normal curve. I'll, I'll explain that a little more as we go along. So if you get a raw score, what you really want to do is find an area. So the question might say something like, if there's a normally distributed something or other, and we, and we know that one observation has blah, blah value, then what percentage of the time would we expect to find that value or something more extreme? Or that's a percentage problem. Or you could say what proportion or percentage of individuals in that, um, in that distribution, in that data set, should have a score lower than that or something like that. So we're always talking about areas inside a normal curve, a normal distribution. To find those areas, we can't just take the raw score, at least not without a computer, and just find the areas, we have to find the z-score first. In other words, we have to translate this raw score into a raw score in the distribution that we call the standard normal distribution that has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. That's another way of looking at what a z-score is. It's, it's what this score would look like if it was in the standard normal distribution. 
that distribution that's like the pure prototype distribution of all normal distributions that has a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, the z-score distribution. Well, we use the formula to find the z-score. And then from the z-score, we need to use a table, a normal probability table located in the back of your book. Or you can use R, and I'll do that in this lecture too. Or maybe the next one, I can't remember. And then we find an area. Sometimes we're given an area or a percentage or a probability, and what we need to find is a raw score. Those problems will look something like, um, if I wanted to select only students that scored in the highest, uh, you know, 10% on the ACT, then what should be my cutoff score? Well, highest 10% tells you, you know, you're up here, you want this area to be 10%. There's some cutoff point, I don't know where, somewhere. And you want to find that cutoff point so that the area is 10%. So to find that cutoff point, you look in the table to find the z-score that cuts off 10% on the top end, or 90% on the bottom end, of this distribution. So that 10% of the observations would be above it, and 90% would be below. So you find that z-score, and then you look at the mean and standard deviation of the, of the test you're talking about. So like, if it was the ACT, it might be 21 and 6, like we saw in the last lecture. Or the SAT, the old one, would be 500 and 100. And so then you take that z-score which is in this perfect idealized standard normal distribution world with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And you, and you use this formula, which is just a mathematical rearranging of this, and you translate the z-score back into a raw score. So you go from, so sometimes you're given a raw score and you're supposed to find an area or a percentage or proportion. Sometimes you're given an area, or percentage or proportion and you need to go back and find the raw score. We'll do both of those kinds of things. So, Z-scores are just a scaling process, a process of changing the scale of measurement. So old GRE scores were measured like this, with a mean of 500 and a standard deviation of 100. So one standard deviation up is 600, two standard deviations up is 7, three is 800. And you actually, real valuable variables, um, they have a minimum and a maximum. The GRE, you couldn't get a score lower than 200. So if anybody tells you on the GRE or the SAT they got like a, a 50, they might not know what they're talking about. Because um, in the old school system, well, the new one has a different scaling system, but in the old school system, it went from 200 to 800. So you can measure like this in raw scores, or you can measure in standard deviations. So you can start from the mean of zero, the mean which is zero standard deviations away from the mean. One, whatever the score at one standard deviation away is gives you a z-score of one, and then a z-score of two and three. One standard deviation down is negative one, negative two, negative three. And like that, it's all just a matter of perspective. Values from any distribution, not just normal, can be seen as raw scores, and I'll use that term a lot. That means the original observations, like what was your actual score on this test? What is your actual height, etc. Or z-scores. And that's after they've been standardized. That's after they've been run through that z-score formula. In other words, that's just expressing the raw scores as how many standard deviations that raw score is away from the mean and in which direction. So it's just a conversion to a different format, sort of like time zones. If it's 10.30 here, then what time is it in Seattle? That kind of thing. It's like money. If I have, if something costs, um, you know, 263 pesos when you're on Reynosa, then what is that in American cash? It's just a conversion. You're, the values kind of exist in both worlds, and you just have to jump back and forth between them. So the reason we use z-scores is because all z-scores can, can be compared with each other. They are standardized. All z-scores, it's like taking whatever distribution that you started with, z -sc a distribution of scores or heights or dollars or whatever it is, and saying, what if the, to compare it with all the other z-score things in the world, Let's, pre let's convert it to a system where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. This is what we mean by standardizing. A z-score is sometimes called a standard score or standardized score. So let's look at kind of a demonstration of this. Um, if you have z-scores, you can put on the x-axis of this normal distribution, zero is always at the mean. And you can count z-scores, standard deviations. So this is the normal distribution that has standard deviation of 1. So here is the mean, 0. 
One standard deviation up is one. Two standard deviations up is another one, which is two. Three standard deviations up is another one, which is three, etc. And down you go negative one, negative two, negative three. So that's z scores. Well, you can have any raw scores you want laid over the top of that. Let's say this is temperature. Let's say these are the average temperatures at some relatively cold place in the world. Let's say the mean of that temperature is 48, and the standard deviation is 7 degrees. So one standard, devi st standard deviation above the mean is 55 degrees. Two standard deviations is two sevens, which is 62, etc. Going down, one standard deviation, 7 degrees, is 41 degrees. So you see how that works. But a, a z-score of negative 1.0 in this distribution would be 41 degrees. So what if we had IQ? IQ is usually measure, measured on a scale that's manipulated so that the mean is 100, the standard deviation is 15. So here's an IQ scale. A negative 1 there is now 85. A positive 1 there is now 115 because you're counting by 15s now and you're starting from 100. So it's all about where you start from and how big the steps are. Let's say ACT math score. Um, in some populations, the distribution was 21 uh, mean and standard deviation of 5. So there would be 21 as the mean. And if you go down 5 points, negative 1 standard deviation is 16. So a z-score of negative 1 is a raw score of 16. A z-score of negative 2 is a raw score of 11. Let's say there's some variable, the percentage of cans that are recycled by hundreds and hundreds of people, and the average is 21%, and the standard deviation is 3%. So 21% is the mean, and one standard deviation down from that is 18. So 18 in this distribution is a z-score of negative 1. Neg uh, 15 is a z-score of negative 2. 24 is a z-score of 1. 27 is a z-score of 2. Let's say body mass index. I actually looked this up for some big funky population. Uh, let's say the mean is 27.5 and the standard deviation is 4.1. So we start from 27.5 right here. And we go 4.1 up from there. Uh, BMI it is, is weird in units. We just say BMI points or something. So a BMI of 31.6 is plus 1 z-score. A BMI of 35.7 is plus 2. So you go 4.1 up. 4.1 up. If you go 4.1 down from 27.5, you get here. So a negative, a negative 1 z-score corresponds to 23.4 in raw scores, in x scores. Negative 2 as a z-score is 19.3 in raw scores. Psychology GPA. Let's say the mean is 3.15 for all UTPA psychology majors, and the standard deviation is 0 0.3. So 3. 1.5 is the mean, and you go 0 0.3. Um, a person who has a 3.45 GPA is has a z-score of 1 within this distribution, 3.75 a z-score of 2. Now you notice the normal distribution in this math, it has no limits placed on it. In reality, we have limits. Every score has, well, most scores have theoretical or real limits on them. So, of course, the math can tell you that a z-score of 3 would be 4.05, but you can't get a a GPA of 4.05. So when you're calculating things, you'd have to say, well, nobody can get a z-score above, you know, 2.95 or whatever that turns out to be. So the theoretical values can be kind of crazy sounding, and you need to be the smart person that translates that. So when you're doing z-scores, sometimes it's handy to just kind of mentally do some anchor points. So let's say there's a distribution of the median daily wages of a whole bunch of nations around the world, and the mean is $12 a day, and the standard deviation is 5. Well, if you're doing a problem, it might be handy for you to say, <coughs> let's just get some, some big numbers. What would, um, what would the mean wages be for a nation that had a z-score of, of 2? Well, a nation that had a z-score of 2 would be 2 of these above this. So 5 and 5 from 12. So 12 plus 5 makes 17 plus 5 makes 22. So it would be $22 a day. So the two standard deviation point would be 22. Um, one standard deviation below would be this minus 5 would be $7 a day. And exactly equal, if you had a nation that made $12 a day on average, then that, that would have a z-score of 0. So sometimes it's handy to just give yourself some quick anchor points, sometimes just so you know what, what's going on, what the real z-scores should be, what's reasonable answers for things. For normal distributions, if we know 
Now, it, as I said, z-scores can be used for any distribution, but we especially like them for normal distributions because z-scores are just measuring in standard deviation units. And within a normal distribution, if you start at the mean and measure in any direction and you know the precise number of standard deviations that you are, that a certain point is away from the mean, then mathematically you can use a really complex formula, or in our case a table, or R, and you can always know the exact proportion of the total area that's greater than x, or less than x, or between the mean and x, or between x and another x, or something like that. <coughs> but since each normal distribution has a different mean and a different standard deviation, that's why we measure in z-scores. We standardize them all so that you can always know how many standard deviations something is away from the mean. Just turn everything into z-scores and then you can just look in one table and find those areas. So the normal distribution is kind of special among, there are other families of distributions too, but if you know the mean and standard deviation and you know the standard deviation value of something, the standard deviation difference between a certain score and the mean, in other words the z-score, then you can just look up in a table and find out exactly what area of the distribution is below that or above that. So we can know the area under any section of the normal distribution curve if we measure in standard deviations. So that means we can find the proportion of observations above or below a certain cutoff point, the percent or the probability of selecting a specific observation or a specific observation falling within this range. These things, I'll go, I'll try and mention this a lot, proportion, percent, probability, they're interchangeable in these kinds of problems. And when you change x to z, it's as if you're standardizi standardizing the entire distribution, not just one score. So one handy table. So area is probability. Let's just explain that a bit. It does kind of make sense if you think about it. If you were to randomly sample one observation from the distribution represented in this pie chart, which the writers of our textbook would not ap approve of because it's a pie chart, then what is the probability that you would randomly get a person who was married? Probability is 61.2% because 61.2% of the observations are married, of the people are married. What's the probability of getting someone who's single? Well, that's 22.6%. What's the probability of widowed? 7.3%. What if you were randomly selecting these names from a hat and you knew these were the percentages of the observations in that hat, the proportions? So in this pie chart, 61.2% of the area of the chart represents the 61.2% of people who are married. And you can say, if I were to randomly select one person from this whole distribution, the probability that that person would be married is 61.2% or 0.612. So do you see how area and probability are essentially the same thing if you phrase the problem the right way? And we'll do that a lot. So here's the normal distribution, and here's what I mean by being able to measure in standard deviation units. If you start from here and you measure one standard deviation, always that jump, and it's symmetrical, left and right, so that jump from zero to one standard deviation or zero to negative one standard deviations, that always includes 34.13% of all the observations. In other words, 34.13% of the area, 0.3413 proportion of the area, under the entire curve. From 1 to 2 is always 0.1359, 13.6% more or less. From 2 to 3 is always 2%, 2.14%. From 3 to 4 is always 0 0.00135, <laughs> so 0.14%. Um, those areas are always the same this chart would work for any normal distribution as long as you're measuring in z-scores or measuring in standard deviations. This leads to this nice little rule we have which is the 68, 95, 99, 7 rule. And it's just handy to keep in mind. Between negative one and positive one standard deviations from the mean, one standard deviation below and one standard deviation up, or ne negative one z-score and positive one z-score, you have 68% of the data, 68% of all observations. Because this is like a, a histogram. It's not a histogram exactly, it's a density plot, but it's like a histogram in that the proportion of area means the percentage of observations that, that are accounted for. And you can see 0 0.3413, 0 0.3413, that's going to be 0 0.6426, so 64%. So, or sorry, it's 0 0.6826. 68% of the data will be between negative 1 and positive 1 z-scores or one standard deviation below and above. 95% of the data 
will be in this space here between negative 2 and positive 2 and we're going to use that pretty handily so the 68 percent plus the 13 and, and a half percent here and a half percent this all together makes up 95 percent of the data and then 99.7 percent of the data is between negative 3 and positive 3 now it keeps going because it goes on to infinity it's just that these little slices get smaller and smaller and smaller so the 68 95 99 7 rule can be handy so if you if you know that at one college the SAT verbal scores were distributed like this with a mean of 504 and a standard deviation of 111 then you can figure out that between 393 and 615 points 68 percent of all students at that university got scores between those two points 95 percent of the students at that university got scores between 282 and 726 and you know that by starting at 504 and measuring two standard deviations up 222 up and 222 down so 111 and 111 111 and 111 etc so the standard the, these relationships hold whether we stretch this by giving it a bigger standard deviation because here we have large number of standard deviations but the z-scores for one standard deviation remain the same although I didn't align them very well or whether you squish it and now the standard deviation is much smaller now the standard deviation is like maybe 625 so here the standard deviation might be 40 so this would be a distribution of ACT scores that was or SAT scores that was really spread out this might be a distribution where everybody scored really similarly to each other but if you convert to z-scores the percentages under those stripes there under the area under the curve is exactly the same in raw scores it won't work but as long as you convert to z-scores it will work no matter how big or small the distribution uh, standard deviation is so what kinds of questions can we answer with this we can say if we were to randomly sample from a normally distributed population with blah blah mean and blah blah standard deviation what is the probability of obtaining a value greater than or equal to 25 or 200 some value that we will call X what's the probability of obtaining a value less than or equal to this what's the probability of obtaining a value between some X and some other X X1 and X2 what's the probability of obtaining a value between the mean and this X value these are all questions that we can answer and they can be very important and interesting for helping us understand our data boy this one's just going on isn't it so the area under the curve um, if we want to find the percentile for the score z of x equals 0.25 and we want to find the proportion of scores greater than z of x that's going to be 0.75 so the percentile of z of x if we know that that equals 0.25 percentile means proportion or percentage of scores below this now let's say I just switched to proportions here I know I'm going back and forth I'll try and clarify so if 25% of the scores, if 0.25 of the scores are below a certain z-score, then we know that the proportion above needs to be 75%. So if the probability that a certain of, of ob obtaining a certain score greater than z of x is 0.4, so if there's a certain score, x, and its z-score, they're going to be the same point really just different scales and the probability of getting a score greater than it, than that is 0.4 then what's the probability of getting a score between the mean and that point well between the mean and infinity on either side is 0.5 so the difference is going to be 0.1 you can think about this it might make sense it might not if the area between the mean and a particular z-score is 0.2 then what's the area beyond? Now beyond we mean going in the direction of the mean away to whatever infinity is there, positive or negative infinity. So if you go if going from mean to some sort of particular z score um, accounts for twenty percent of the of the area under the curve or the proportion of observations, then if you go the west of the way from the mean to infinity, then what percentage will there be? Well, from the mean to that to infinity altogether should be 0.5 so what's left after you've already done the point 0.2 is just point 0.3 more that should have pictures um, area can mean the proportion of possible observations the percentage of possible observations and the big one the probability of obtaining observations within a particular range through random sampling from that distribution
So proportion, percentage, probability. So where are you going to get stuck? Not in calculating z. It's usually pretty easy once you figure out the mechanics. Not in looking up the areas using r or the table. You're going to get stuck in keeping it all straight. So which number is the raw score value? Which number that you wrote down is the z-score? Which number is the probability or the percentage or the area? What's the area you need to find? Is your z-score positive or negative, etc.? So that's what you need to practice with. Now, I'm going to stop here, and we'll dive into yet more z-scores in just a minute.